If you would, turn with me to uh, Luke chapter 3. We are going to continue our series uh, called CSI, which is uh, Christ's Story Investigated. It is a, uh, a I don't want to say an exhaustive look at the Gospel of Luke, but it's uh, to... <laughs> It's something. I don't, I, I don't know what I was saying. I just, uh, um, it's, a, it's, a, in, it's a thorough investigation of the Gospel of Luke because the Gospel of Luke is a thorough, or thorough investigation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke was not just one who took the stories, uh, took the, uh, the, uh, the message that he heard and just took it to heart. He was one who said, I want to know if this is true. And because I'm an educated man, because I'm not one easily swayed by myths, I want to find out if what has been told to me is true. So the Gospel of Luke is a, uh, is a pursuit by Luke, a pursuit of holiness. And at the end of it, he found the Holy One, and he wrote about it. He wrote about his findings. And those findings we find, the Gospel of Luke... And we find the continuation of the story of Jesus Christ working in and through his people in the Gospel of Acts. And uh, today, we're looking at chapter 3. And chapter 3 is really an, an investigation of Jesus' friends. Uh, here to this point, we have investigated the background of Jesus Christ. We have looked at uh, Jesus' family. We talked in the first sermon about it's all in the family. We talked about how his heritage and his background that was passed on from mother to son. From, uh, and it's a thorough investigation of the Gospel of Luke because the Gospel of Luke is a thorough, or a thorough investigation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke was not just one who took the stories, uh, took the, uh, the, uh, the message that he heard and just took it to heart. He was one who said, I want to know if this is true. And because I'm an educated man, because I'm not one easily swayed by myths, I want to find out if what has been told to me is true. So the Gospel of Luke is a, uh, is a pursuit by Luke, a pursuit of holiness. And at the end of it, he found the Holy One, and he wrote about it. He wrote about his findings. And those findings we find, the Gospel of Luke... And we find the continuation of the story of Jesus Christ working in and through his people in the Gospel of Acts. And uh, today, we're looking at chapter 3. And chapter 3 is really an, an investigation of Jesus' friends. Uh, here to this point, we have investigated the background of Jesus Christ. We have looked at uh, Jesus' family. We talked in the first sermon about it's all in the family. We talked about how his heritage and his background that was passed on from mother to son, from stepfather to son, was integral in his development. Uh, last week, uh, we talked about uh, the shepherds and the, and the message and how it came to those who were, we wouldn't have chosen we would have chosen the righteous to bring the first announcement of the Messiah. But Jesus chooses the lowly because it's the lowly that needs the message. And today we're going to investigate more background information on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to investigate his friends, specifically John the Baptist. And as I thought about the, um, uh, Jesus' friends this week, I thought about my friends, and I thought about how important friends are to each and every one of us. And, and because a, a, a friend goes a long way in showing us who we truly are. We, you've probably heard the saying uh, previously that, show me a man's friends, and it will reveal his character. Okay? I think that is abundantly true. And I, I was thinking about that a lot this week because um, 
I lost a cell phone. I don't know if you guys know that, but I was without a cell phone for two weeks. And I finally got my new cell phone. And uh, one of the things that I was thinking about as uh, I'm going through the process of getting a new phone was that I am so incredibly thankful that cell phones weren't available to people like me in high school. And, and the reason that I say that is because a cell phone can be very dangerous for a guy like me, okay? Uh, I, I see what kids do with cell phones now. They take pictures of everything and document it. They take them and they forward them to Facebook and put them on this public platform. In the cell phones, you have that contact list. The contact list are those people that you want to get a hold of. You want to know when they call. And, and for me, in high school, a cell phone would have been incriminating. If I would have lost my cell phone in high school, I would have been paranoid about what my parents would have found on it if they found it. Um, and, and as I was thinking about that, I was thinking... That's a, that's a real issue. That I was worried about a text message that maybe my mom and dad would read. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't say those things. Maybe I shouldn't say those things publicly. Or maybe the friends that I'm choosing to associate myself with are probably not the best influences on me. And with that said, friends do, as we know, have a great influence just have this profound uh, platform within our lives. And, and your friends have this way of shaping you and molding you. Not only do we get a reflection of a man's character within the circle of his friends, but we get a glimpse into his future, what his future is going to be like because of the people he chooses to hang around. Uh, we've all, who are parents, have all told our kids, well, if Johnny jumped off a bridge, would you jump off it too? And then your smart aleck kid probably said, yeah, I would do it. And you think to yourself, you know what? I'm mad because you said that. But when I was your age, with the people I was hanging around with, I probably would have jumped. And that brings to the surface the issue. Who are the people that we surround ourselves with? And what do the people that we surround ourselves with tell others about our character and tell others about our nature? And what does it say about our future? And I raise this issue because in Jesus' friends, we get a glimpse of not only who he would become, what his nature was, what his character was, but what his future was would hold. And we see that in no brighter contrast than in John the Baptist. So if you would, turn with me to Luke chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 1 through 6. Because in John, we see these three profound traits that we also see in Jesus Christ. And hopefully we see in one another. But the, the first of these traits, John was a man of purpose. And we'll see that in the text. Starting in verse 1, the Word of God says this, In the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetra, Tetrarch of Eritrea, and Trachantus, and Licinius, uh, Tetrarch of Abilene during the priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. <clears throat> the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the desert. He went into the desert around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord and make straight his paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads will become straight and the rough way smooth 
and all mankind will see God's salvation. So what we see here is John, this, uh, this wild man, as the scripture depicts, this is a guy who clothed themselves in, in, in camel's hair and had a, a, a leather belt around his waist. A man who never cut his hair. That sound familiar to you? It should. Um, a man who ate uh, wild honey and locusts. Okay? This was a, an odd duck. And he was odd because he was committed fully and solely to the Lord. This was a man of purpose. And in that purpose, we see a couple of things. We see that uh, because he was a man of purpose, the word of God came to him. You ever think about that? The word of God came to him. Okay? And, and that in and of itself was his driving purpose. That was his motivation. God spoke, so he was going to respond. And because he desired within the, the deep recesses of his heart to follow after the Lord, he had this clear direction. The word of the Lord came to him and he responded. Now we make Christianity incredibly complex. We say, God has spoken. I, I read his word. Now what should I do? Should I gather together a Bible study group and we should discuss the Greek and the Hebrew and then we should discuss 10 different ways in which it would look like if I did respond to the word of God. But for John, it was so much more simplistic. God spoke. He had clear direction. He responded. My question to you, saints, is why would we do anything less? If your parents give you instruction, the expectation is response. If God the Father speaks, why would we not respond? But we also see in John this man of purpose, a man who had this concrete determination. It, and this point is lifted up in um, verse 3 where it says, He went into the hill country around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, I want you to think about that. His message wasn't an easy message. The, when the word of the Lord came to John, it wasn't, Hey, John, go give everybody a lollipop and a hug. It wasn't that. It wasn't, hey John, go tell some jokes and make everybody laugh. It was, go tell them to repent. Repent means that they were living in sin and he had to point that out and then call them back to God. That's a tough message. That's a tough ministry. But he had this concrete determination because God spoke, he was going to go. Because God spoke, he could do nothing less than carry out his purpose. Now I think back to high school. I think of my friends. <clears throat> my friends were all athletes. Okay? At Sheridan High School, which is why you see this shirt, okay? Uh, Sheridan High School <clears throat> is a football school, okay? Nine and one is not acceptable at Sheridan High School. <clears throat> Ten and zero, oh, birth in the state playoffs and, and state championships are what's expected. That's the culture from the time that you enter Pee Wee football at third grade until you graduate. If you lose two games, <clears throat> you have people coming up on to you on the street saying, "What happened, guys? We're eight and two. That's, that's not acceptable, okay? And, and, and because of that, I had a, a group of friends who had a clear direction. Our life was to be working out. Our life was to be learning our plays. Our life was to be a life of sacrifice for one another so that we could be successful on the football field because there was huge expectations given to us. And because of that, you either embraced it or you ran from it. And those who embraced it had this concrete determination. And this shirt is a depiction of that. It's not for no reason that I wear this. You know, I began my morning this